Berta, and I'm going to be giving you the introduction to machine learning artificial intelligence talk. So let's not waste any time. Some basic housekeeping items to start. This is your first lecture in the series that's being piloted this year. Right now, we have both healthcare professionals and non-healthcare professionals in this lecture. After these series of lectures, you should be able to hopefully pick the stream that you want to focus on and get a good understanding of artificial intelligence and how you could use it in your futures. Uh, another note, if there are questions that you have during this talk, please put them in the chat. Shane is going to organize them, and I've scheduled some time to answer those questions. Uh, we might not get to all of them, so we'll focus on the main ones. But if there's time afterwards, I'll happily try and answer some questions. Uh, so starting off, you might have some questions like these. What does it mean for a computer to be intelligent? How is it that everything in medicine could just be converted into computers entirely. Uh, questions like this are important, but they're a bit too big in scope right now. I always find when you're approaching something as ridiculously intense and broad as artificial intelligence, it's great to start with an example. So I want you to take a look at this image. What you're seeing here is if there's MDs in the chat, they probably already know this is a mammogram of the breast. It's x-rays taken of the breast tissue in order to assess for cancer. What you see highlighted in this box here, that's some kind of abnormality, but there's a catch. I want you right now to just think about it, just looking at this little mark on this x-ray here and think about whether or not this is cancer, this weird looking gray spot. Just use your intuition does this look normal to you? Bear in mind though, that if you say this is cancer and you are wrong, this patient may have to go through multiple years of treatment, including chemotherapy and surgery, or even worse, if you say that this isn't cancer and it later turns out to be cancer, then by the time you catch it, it might be too advanced and this patient might not have any options left. Okay, got an idea in your head? Now, what you're probably thinking is most of us are not trained doctors. We're not specialized in breast cancer. We don't know how to interpret a mammogram. And fair enough. And how is it fair that I ask you this question? In order to interpret a mammogram properly, you need to go through a lot of training. So most likely what you're going to probably do is you're going to go through the Mammography Quality Standards Act, which governs how we grade mammographies. Additionally, whether or not a patient gets cancer is going to depend on their age, their family, their risk factors, and several other things. Not to mention the fact that you're going to go through three to four years of undergraduate studies and then four years of medical school. And on top of that, five years of residency, uh, fellowship, et cetera, et cetera, just to be able to interpret one mammogram. And to top all of this off, if you take a thousand women and screen them with mammograms over the age of 70, 219 of them are going to have a false positive. So is there some way to make a diagnosis without all of this hassle that is at least as accurate, if not more accurate than a doctor would be able to do. Let's go back to this image. I asked you, does this look like cancer to you? And you came up with some answer. So what if I told you that in fact, yes, this is cancer. Not only that, but when these researchers trained their AI to recognize cancers, the AI recognized this cancer, whereas zero out of six board certified radiologists correctly said, that this was cancer. How does that make any sense? How is this even possible? Is there any point going into radiology and medicine anymore? Should we just abandon our degrees and give in to the robot overlords? Well, no, hold on a minute. Hopefully after this lecture, you're going to be able to come away with some sort of understanding of what AI is and how you'll be able to use it for things like diagnosing cancer, what its benefits are, and most importantly, what its shortcomings are. So in the next 45-ish minutes, I'm gonna give you an introduction to artificial intelligence. Mainly we're gonna be talking about things like what is AI, statistics, machine learning, neural networks. If you've heard these terms before, we're gonna get into those. We're gonna talk about how an AI works with a couple of examples. And of course, not everyone here is a healthcare professional. So we're gonna give a little bit of a brief history of medicine and how AI relates to medicine. What are the potentials of AI in medicine and what are some of the problems we can solve? And most importantly, what are the caveats of things like AI? 
Uh, just before we quickly get started, I'll mention a couple things. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm a second year medical student here at the University of Alberta. Before that, I worked at the BC Genome Science Center as a software developer. And part of my job was using things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to diagnose cancers more accurately and give people more information. That being said, I do not pretend that I have nearly enough PhDs to be able to cover an intense topic as machine learning and computer science nor do I have any PhDs in medicine. So don't think of this as a talk that's going to suddenly give you all the AI information that you know of. What I can say is that because I can Google science related questions better than your average bear, I'm qualified to teach some amount of computer science to healthcare students. And because I know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, I can relay some amount of medicine knowledge to computer science students. So bottom line, take everything we say here with a grain of salt. This isn't meant to be your definitive guide on AI. This is more to get your brains working with the concepts, introduce them in a level playing field and to get you excited about the future of AI. So I think it's probably fair that you've heard about artificial intelligence at some point in your life, just through popular media. If we go to the matrix and artificial intelligence rebels against humanity, enslaves them, traps them in a large computer simulation to eventually just harvest them for energy. The matrix explores a number of themes, including what happens when an AI takes over. Uh, on the right, you have Blade Runner, excellent movie, where there exist robot servants nearly identical to humans used for menial labor and basically a subservient slave class. Blade Runner explores the relationships between humans and their constructed replicants, essentially their own artificial intelligence. It explores aspects like transhumanism and AI autonomy. And then we have the movie AlphaGo. AlphaGo follows the DeepMind Learning Group, where they strive to create and refine an artificial intelligence capable of beating the world's best Go player, Lee Sedol. For those who don't know, Go is a strategy board game involving placing stones to capture territory. There are many international tournaments, world-recognized Go experts. There are literally hundreds of years of strategy and tactics that have gone into humans becoming the best that they possibly could at this game. And sure enough, the AlphaGo AI was able to beat the world's best Go player. And to much surprise, the AI didn't just copy moves from other players, but instead it came up with its own novel play. It actually bamboozled a lot of the adjudicators because the AI would make plays that seemed disadvantageous, seemed like they weren't going anywhere, but were actually highly advanced. In a sense, this AI opened up a brand new field of play and defeated the world's best Go player. So if I asked you to pick which one of these is the most accurate description of artificial intelligence, you may say AI in AlphaGo is the most accurate. And fair enough, by definition, it actually exists in our reality. But the point I'm getting across here is that we've long been exploring the ideas and possibilities of artificial intelligence with thought experiments, philosophy like Descartes, uh, Simulacra and Simulacrum, which have gone on to influence things like The Matrix and like Harrison Ford. Before you even got into this talk here, you've probably been dealing with more AI than you know about. And we're constantly pushing the boundaries of science in order to without regard for things like Blade Runner's externalities. We've been toying with AI forever, but it's only in the past several decades that we've really broken through. So a little bit about history of artificial intelligence. The term artificial intelligence can be traced back to John McCarthy in 1986, or sorry, 1956, considered one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence. He described AI as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. And it's his work and the work of his peers that started the field of artificial intelligence as its own separate realm of science worthy of independent study. We also have Arthur Samuel, another one who's popularized the term machine learning. What Samuel did is he created an experiment where he pitted two computers against each other in a game of checkers. He assigned different advantageous board positions with a higher score. So if you had a different number of kings, you had pieces on the opposite side of the board, you would get a higher score. And then he simply gave the computer a task, try to optimize and get the maximum value you can by are mimicking these board positions. In effect, what he did is he gave the ability for these computers to learn without explicitly being programmed to. 
And more specific to our purposes today, we have Rena Dechter. She was the first to use the term deep learning in the scientific literature, where she described computational models that are composed of multiple layers of learning representations of data with multiple levels of abstraction. Now, this definition may seem complicated, but over the course of these lectures, you'll be able to learn how and what this means and why it adds so much value to the field. So let's take a step back a bit. What actually is an AI? An AI or an artificial intelligence, when we mostly think about that, we're talking about a series of networks and nodes. You can see like in this image right down here, hopefully this pen works, yes. That what you're looking at is effectively an artificial intelligence, just a series of networks and nodes that performs some kind of statistical function. Uh, you can see these lines are connecting different nodes together. And in the end, it's supposed to produce something we're not exactly sure yet, we'll get into it. The main thing to realize is that there are three main steps to an AI. Firstly, you feed it a bunch of data. Secondly, you perform some math. And thirdly, you output some data. That's it. If that seems like an oversimplification, I assure you it's really not. That's basically the gist of all artificial intelligence is. If you can just feed it data, test it, and have it output something, you've effectively created a neural network, artificial intelligence. But this is kind of an abstract way of thinking about it. Let's, let's start with the basics, okay. At its most basic form, the building block of AI is the neuron, this little circle here. This circle has two components. It has input data and it has some kind of output data. So you see what the neuron does is it takes some input information and it does some kind of transformation to it any kind of mathematical operation to produce output data. Let's say your input data is something like just the number six. And the neurons function is going to be to take whatever you input it and multiply it by two. At the end, you get 13, I mean 12. That's basically what it is. That's the building block of AI. So this structure of data manipulation is analogous to the neurons that you have in your body. The, for example, the neurons in your eyes, uh, light enters your eyes, that's your input data. So you might have a sun with some bright lights and those are just gonna enter the neurons into your eye. What that neuron does is it receives that signal and it produces an electrical charge that it sends down this axon towards its axon terminals. And then it connects to some other output. Or let's say you touch something, the pressure is applied to your fingertips. That is the input data. It's some kind of pressure or force. And sure enough, that triggers the neurons on the tip of your finger. And then those neurons, they transform that input data. And again, they output an electrical signal. You can see the analogy here. The mechanical neuron above is basically the same thing as the neuron that you have below. Now, importantly, just like the neurons in your body, the neurons in our AI can send signals to one another. Here we have one neuron that's accepting some kind of input data, and it's feeding out signals to other neurons adjacent to it, to these three other neurons. And then all these other neurons, they're eventually feeding into one last neuron, and that's eventually going to give you some kind of output. So, we call this structure here a neural network. It's a series of individual neurons that perform some kind of operation on their input and produce a new output. Okay, so that's the basic building blocks of an AI. Uh, Shane, do we have any pressing questions? None at the moment. Okay, uh, please keep track of those as they come in. And if any come up, uh, just flag me down if we're not in the middle of a break. So. When you look at a figure like this, you might ask, okay, I kind of get it. You have a series of circles, they accept inputs, they do some math and they produce an output. How can this most basic structure do anything of use? How can it perform any kind of useful task? Well, you know what, that's a bit complicated. Let's use an example. Okay, empty your minds for a second. I want you to imagine we have this student named Terry. Uh, Terry, what happens is uh, Terry's got a quiz due tomorrow. It's one question long, and Terry can attempt this quiz an infinite number of times. Also, Terry is incredibly lazy. If this sounds like someone you know, there's probably no relation. 
So there he has this quiz. It's one question long. He's allowed infinite numbers of attempts. He loads up the quiz. And knowing that Terry can just take the test again, they pick an answer at random. The mitochondria is the center of the cell. And to no one's surprise, Terry's first guess is wrong. But that's OK, Terry. There's an infinite amount of attempts that you can have on this quiz. On the second attempt, Terry guesses B. And lo and behold, Terry gets it right. So thus far, Terry's strategy is to pick an answer at random. If it's wrong, change it. Try again. If it's right, success. OK, everyone following so far? All right, new take home quiz. This time, it's 10 question long. 10 questions long. And again, Terry has infinite attempts. And to prevent anyone from just memorizing the series of answers, the order of the questions is randomized. Now again, Terry being an exceptionally lazy student decides to just do the same thing as last time. Instead of actually studying on the first attempt, Terry just sets all of the answers to A and hits submit. And of course, Terry fails pretty, pretty abysmally. Only got 30% correct. Only slightly better than just guessing at random. But no big deal. On the second attempt, if Terry gets a question right, leave that answer alone. If Terry gets a question wrong, change it, try again. And simple enough, it looks like most of them are wrong, but the scores improved a little bit with each successive try. All right, well, let's try it again. Again, if the question you got the answer right, leave it. If it was wrong, change it, do something else. And again, you see it got slightly better this time. Suppose we let Terry continue like this again and again, changing answers until eventually Terry gets 100% on the quiz. Notice that with each attempt, Terry's performance improves just a little bit. In a sense, what Terry is doing is they're training themselves using these quiz questions. Now, is this quick? No. It takes a lot of time to keep refreshing the page, resubmitting, checking your answers. But for a small quiz like this, it's manageable and it's slightly faster than studying normally. But there's a new problem. Terry has a pop quiz. This time, it's five questions long. And most importantly, you only get one attempt. So no guessing and checking, no changing your answers. Now, if you've studied the material like a proper good student, all the quiz questions are going to be very similar to the ones in the previous questions. So you should do pretty good, but they're not gonna be exactly the same. So how does Terry perform when we evaluate Terry with this brand new set of questions? Well, here's the quiz. Now, if you look closely at some of these questions, they are very similar to the ones on previous take-home quizzes. Not exactly the same, but given that Terry spent so long training with those take-home quizzes, maybe they gleaned enough information to let them answer these ones. So Terry gives it their best shot, and lo and behold, they get 80% of them right. Is it perfect? No. In fact, it probably would have been just better for everyone to study normally, but it was good enough to pass. And that's all that matters. So let's summarize. What Terry basically did is they trained on take-home quizzes. They started by initially guessing answers. Then they changed their answers if they were wrong. Their final performance was evaluated on a quiz with similar questions. And in the end, they passed. Terry did OK, but they could have done better if they just actually studied like a normal person. Now, this is where I have to come clean about Terry. Um, as you can tell, Terry is probably someone uh, who you might recognize. So Terry is not what they seem. You see, Terry is really just a bunch of neurons wrapped in a meat suit. Terry is a neural network. We gave Terry some input data. Then we questioned them on these take-home quizzes. We asked Terry to perform well on the quiz. And we kept training Terry again and again and again. Every time they got a question wrong, well, they tweaked their neural network slightly. They changed their answer and they tried again. Hopefully from this example, you'll see that this AI, this neural network Terry that we created learns kind of like you and I do. You start by just giving data and you repeatedly evaluate your performance. If you get something wrong, you change your approach and you try again. Over time, as you develop on a task, you get better and better. The neurons inside your head move and remodel into different shapes and forms. Imagine the first time you might have started learning about something like biology or physics, which was a difficult subject for me. When I first started with physics, I was just guessing the best that I possibly could. And I got a lot of tests and a lot of questions wrong. But over time, I got better at it. 
Over time, the neurons in my brain started to remodel in different ways, enough so that I could get reasonably good at answering physics questions on tests and understanding the concept of physics. The same thing's happening here, except instead of us remodeling our own neural circuitry within our brains, it's just a computer rewiring the neural circuits on a motherboard. So let's say that we want to create a neural network for real this time. We want to create a neural network that can view a picture and label it as a cat or a dog. In this case, our input is cat and dog pictures, and we want our outputs to be these labeled versions of these cats and these dog pictures. How does the AI learn what a cat is and what a dog is? Well, the same way as before, by training. We start out with a simple neural network just five neurons in total, where each neuron transforms its input a little bit and it sends it off to the next neuron. We train it by providing it a couple hundred photos of dogs and cats. And we say, okay, neural network, I want you to do the best that you can to try and label all of these pictures as either a dog or a cat. And then we evaluate its performance. You can see that this neural network got half the labels right and half the labels wrong. It's no better than guessing at this point, but that's okay. I'm sure when you first tried a new skill or learned a new course, you were pretty bad too. But with enough training and practice, you reviewed the neurons in your head. You got them into the right shape and got the right connections going to get good at that task. Well, we're gonna do the same thing here with our neural network. We went ahead and we changed the structure of our neural network just a tiny bit. You can see there's a couple of neurons that were added. Some of the connections are changed around. And this time it performed slightly better. Its accuracy went from 50% to 52%. Now you might ask, how did we decide which neurons to change and in what order? That's a question that will be answered in further lectures. For now, just take it for granted that this new structure of neurons and connections, it evolved from the previous one. So we got a 2% increase in accuracy. Let's, uh, let's keep going with this. Let's try again. This time we are going to evaluate its performance and we're gonna change a little bit of the neural network structure and we're gonna repeat. This time we got a structure that is 54% accurate. Okay, let's do it again. Now we have a structure that's 60% accurate. And then we do it again. Now we have a structure that's 61% accurate. We repeat this process of training, evaluating, tweaking, training, evaluating, tweaking hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of times. For any one person, this would be an impossible task. But for a computer, this only takes a couple of hours, or if you have enough processing power, a couple of minutes. Each time the structure changes, it gets slightly better at identifying what's a cat and what's a dog. After hundreds and hundreds of rounds of training and evaluating, we end up with this network here. You can see that it's a lot different than the one that we started with. The connections between the nerves are different, or rather the neurons are different. Some have new connections, some were lost, but overall, it's definitely not the same thing that we started with, but we noticed that it's gotten a lot better at identifying dogs and cats. It's now 85% accurate. And most importantly, it can process hundreds of images in just a couple seconds. But this could just be random chance. Just to be sure, let's do one final test. Let's take 50 brand new images that have never been seen by this network before. We ask the network to label these photos and ask how good it performs on them. Well, we run the network and this is what we get. Is this what you were expecting? Despite all the training we did, we trained this network hundreds of thousands of times. It still got a couple of them wrong. Why is that? Well, maybe there's something wrong with a couple of these images. Maybe this neural network sees, okay, well, that's got some gray fur. It's got some extra fins. Oh, that's probably a dog, right? Despite the fact that we trained this network so many times, it's only natural that it's gonna have some inaccuracies here and there. But overall, it didn't do too bad. It got 75% of these questions correct. Our network we can say is, pretty good at identifying cats and dogs and labeling the photos appropriately. But more importantly, it can process hundreds, if not thousands of photos in a couple of seconds where it would take a human minutes or hours to do so. If this example seems irrelevant, recognize that this technique is essential to all of how AIs work. 
take, for example, this AI that's been trained to detect cars at traffic signals. Any of you want to buy a Tesla in the future? While the exact architecture of this artificial intelligence is different, the basic process of training is the same. You start with a basic neural network, you evaluate it, you change it, and you repeat. How about an artificial intelligence that is trained to recognize the faces of famous characters in movies? Well, same process. Start with a basic neural network, evaluate, and repeat. If you understand the basics of the examples I've brought forward, congratulations, you understand AI. But I know that there's probably some questions associated with this. Shane, are there any major questions that I can hope to answer? We have two questions. The first one is, is this what CAPTCHAs do? I think that's referring to the online prove you're a human by clicking on the pictures, all the pictures that have traffic lights or something like that. Funny story with the CAPTCHAs, in order to obtain the images that we use to train artificial intelligences, we need a lot of images that have been reliably labeled that we can test again. So the CAPTCHAs aren't training AIs. It's more like the CAPTCHA is using you as an individual and your work in order to obtain the labeled images, and then it can send them off to an AI. So the CAPTCHA isn't training an AI. Instead, you are training the AI every time that you uh, answer a CAPTCHA correctly. And the second question? We actually got two more coming in, so three more now. Next is, what determines the number of neurons? Ah, good question. So there are, number, there are a number of different factors that go into deciding how a neural network architecture is designed, how many neurons to use, how many layers, how many rounds of training. In fact, it's complicated enough that we've devoted an entire course to that. For now, because this is just the introduction lecture, I will say that it just sort of naturally evolves from the previous structure. But if you stick with these courses, and most importantly, the workshops, you'll learn about how to decide how many neurons to use. And what's more, you'll learn about more advanced kinds of architectures where you're using more complicated matrices. So sorry, that's a bit of a punt question, but that's the best I can offer you right now. And I think I'll take one more question and then save the last couple for the end. I'll just add that there is some degree of trial and error in choosing numbers. Uh, next question is, how large should a data set be? Ah, so that is a very good question. As always, the general consensus seems to be that more data is better because, the and I should preface this, the more unique data is better. It's not sufficient. Let's say we take our example of training with dogs and cats. It's not sufficient to just have five copies of the same five images and copy that a million times. You would have a couple hundred images, but they would all be the same that wouldn't work. What you want are unique data sets. You want data sets that have enough different features that your AI can learn to recognize it. The exact number of images to use in your data set, well, it depends a lot on what you're going for. The general rule is that more data is better, but it also depends on more things in the architecture of your neural network. But you can get pretty far with just a couple hundred images, like in our example here. Okay. Uh, if there's any super important glaring questions, Shane, feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, I will uh, leave the more questions for later. I think we can continue. Okay. So a couple disclaimers before we keep going forward. These examples that I showed you, there's something called a narrow AI. That is, they are an AI designed to do one thing particularly well. Recognize an image of a dog. Spot a red light. Play go and beat a human. By contrast, a general AI is something that can apply its knowledges to a number of different contexts. Take our dog cat image analyzer that we built a moment ago. What would happen if we put in a picture of a horse and we told it to analyze that? How would it classify that? Well, it wouldn't recognize that it's a horse because the only thing it knows is dogs and cats. It's not able to apply its knowledge in anything outside of the scope that we defined for it. We said, recognize dogs and cats. You give it a horse and it's gonna try its best, but it's not gonna be able to tell that that's something different. So that's a narrow AI. General AI is still something that is kind of theoretical at this point. There are a couple of different research groups who have said that they have achieved a general AI capable of applying its knowledge in a number of new contexts, but it's still mostly theoretical. When you think about a general AI, think about you or me. We got pretty good at identifying dogs and cats when we were young, and we got for enough good at identifying animals that we could recognize that a horse is something different than a dog or a cat. 
it's because of our ability to apply our knowledge in a number of different contexts that we are so successful. AI is not at that point where it can do so yet, but who knows, give it another couple of years and that might change. Now, that's all fine and good, but what does any of this have to do with medicine? Well, we need a bit more information about medicine. Medicine as a discipline is concerned with health. That is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease. The development of medicine as a field is very much rooted in the scientific process. It's about observing and documenting natural phenomena, about forming a hypothesis, gathering data, fitting it to a model, and coming to conclusions that are reproducible by other people. The main distinction is on the focus of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment specific to medicine. Let's, in fact, let's go into some history. If we go far back enough, we'll end up at Hippocrates, so-called the father of medicine, categorized different diseases according to systems called humors. He was wrong about most of these humors, but the idea of categorizing different pathologies, it sort of caught on. Galen, he began describing and exploring the anatomy of different animals and relating that to humans. Fast forward a couple thousand years, Louis Pasteur, he proposed that microorganisms contribute to disease. Sir William Roberts, he noticed that cultures of penicillin glacium mold, they, they don't have bacterial contamination. That's really interesting. John Hall Edwards, he performed the first clinical x-ray of radiographing. He radiographed a needle stuck in his associate's hand. Frederick Branting, he isolated insulin and delivered it to the first diabetic patient. Let's go University of Toronto. How about Alexander Fleming, who isolated penicillin? Jonas Salk, in the world's first polio vaccine. Rosalind Franklin, producing X-ray diffraction images of DNA. Paul Larcherberg, using NMR for the first time. Stanford researchers developing mycine, an early AI for detecting bacterial resistance to antibiotics. And just at the turn of the century, we had the first draft of the human genome. The importance of highlighting these events is to make a point that all the time, medicine spurs or gains so much inspiration from advancement in the natural sciences. It was by isolating molds that we got penicillin and antibiotics. It was by playing around with some weird magnetic rays that we got things like the first images of DNA and the genomic revolution. It's by studying our natural world around us and discovering that we've been able to advance medicine so drastically. And we mention this now because guess what? We're on the brink of a brand new scientific technological revolution, but it's not mold, it's not antibiotics, it's AI. You right now are living in the age of the algorithm, in the age of artificial intelligence. It's going to affect your careers in medicine and outside of medicine in ways that you might not even realize now. In fact, let's take a look at what this might look like. Let's say that we have a patient who shows up to a doctor and they're complaining about something. A doctor goes up to a patient in a, cl a clinic and says, doc, I've got chest pain. What do I do about this? Well, the doctor's got to think about a lot of things here. Are there any red flags that are going on? Uh, do you have any trouble breathing? How about any chest pain? Well, you have chest pain. Does it radiate to your arm? Any arm pain? That could be a sign of a heart attack. Uh, do you have any trouble with physical exertion? Like, are you running out of breath a bit too much, et cetera? Or maybe this is something completely benign. Maybe this is something like gastroesophageal reflux. Maybe you just ate some spicy food. Well, it could be a heart attack. If it is, then we need to do something about that right away. Or maybe this patient, they just walked in from a car accident and they've got major trauma. There's a lot of different things that it could be. And the doctor as soon as you propose your chief complaint to them, they start rifling through all the different pathologies and etiologies that it could be. And next they need to investigate it. Well, what procedures could you do to help narrow down a list like this? Well, you could use your stethoscope. You could, for instance, you could order some blood work. You could do some investigations like x-rays. You could stick your patient in a CT scan to check for cancers or that sort of thing. And lastly, the doctor needs to think about, well, what treatments are available and how effective are they? If this patient has gastroesophageal ge geo reflux, all they need are antacids. But if they have something more insidious, like a heart attack, they're going to need invasive procedures. If they have some major trauma, they might need surgery. 
how do you decide all this information? How do you go through all of these different things in the span of what, with our government changes, a 10 minute interview? That seems pretty ridiculous, but somehow doctors have been able to do it. But the main thing that we can do is we can leverage AI at every level of these tasks that a doctor might ask of their patients to help speed a diagnosis. If the main tasks of a doctor are prevention, the actions taken to avoid acquiring a disease, diagnosis, identifying the cause or nature of the disease, the treatment plan, as well as if those are the main aspects of what a doctor needs to do, then I'm gonna go through examples to show you how AI is making advancements in each one of these fields. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about precision medicine, which is the idea of taking individual patient characteristics into account. So let's say we have start with, I don't know, the heart. For those who don't know me, I'm a brown person, which means that I have to talk about cardiology and medicine. So your heart is this highly regulated mechanism that contracts blood throughout your body. Without it, you're going to die. You're going to get very serious consequences and you're not gonna live very long. Often when a patient is in the hospital and we suspect something is wrong with their heart, we'll hook them up to something called an ECG. The ECG, it measures the heart's electrical impulses at different angles in order to produce this strip that you see on your right here. Now, a trained cardiologist, they can look at this strip and they can tell you very quickly which parts of the heart are working well and which parts are not. And that is a very incredible feat. Cardiologists train a very long time to be able to do this in association with the rest of their job tasks. Now, one of the things that can go wrong with the heart is something called atrial fibrillation. The atria of your heart, they start to beat rapidly, erratically, irregularly. Without that coordinated contraction, the patient can have a stroke. They can have a heart attack or a clot. They could quite possibly die. But unfortunately, the signs that a patient might be having in atrial fibrillation, they're very hard to spot unless you're deliberately looking to catch them. And in order to catch it, you probably need to be looking at an ECG. Now you can imagine, let's say that you're sitting in an emergency room with some heart pain and your doctor hooks you up to an ECG. It's not like they're gonna be sitting at your hospital bed reading that ECG attached to you for 24 hours. No, they've got other things to do. They've got more patients to see. So there simply aren't enough cardiologists around all the time to be able to catch all instances of atrial fibrillation. If only there were some kind of way someone could monitor your ECG 24 seven and alert you to whenever an atrial fibrillation occurs. Well, actually that technology does exist. In fact, doctors at the Mayo Clinic, they developed an artificial intelligence to read ECGs and spot atrial fibrillation. They took the ECGs of more than 600,000 patients and gave that as input data, sorry, 600,000 ECGs and gave that as input data to their neural network. And then they said, okay, network, I want you to decide whether or not this ECG shows atrial fibrillation. They tested it, they evaluated it, they changed it, and they repeated this process hundreds of thousands of times. Over the course of their development, they developed an AI that could diagnose atrial fibrillation with 90% accuracy. That is on par or better than other tests. And what's more, an AI can run 24-7. So you don't need to have a cardiologist standing over your ECG all day, reading it, desperately hoping to catch that one variation. You can just let an AI do it for you maybe. Okay, let's take another example. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of death in women, but it can be caught early with a mammogram and it can be treated. However, when we screen millions of women with mammograms each year, it's only natural that you're going to get false positives and there won't be enough radiologists to keep up with demand. Well, recognizing this demand, a team of researchers worked on an AI that was capable of distracting breast cancers from mammogram data. They trained their AI to, again, more than 28,000 women's mammograms data. Can you imagine reading 28,000 x-rays? You would have to spend your entire career reading x-rays to achieve that number. But for an AI, it can do it in a matter of minutes or hours even. And ultimately, the AI that was developed here, it was able to reduce the false negative rate by almost 10%. That's thousands of women that won't need to undergo invasive, stressful, and often needless procedures. Okay, one more example, skin cancer. 
it is very difficult to tell what is and what isn't skin cancer. A lot of people are diagnosed with it each year. Often it arises from normal looking skin findings. Do you have some sort of weird itch or a dark mole that you think is probably not cancer, but you aren't going to the doctor just in case it is cancer and you don't wanna know? Well, that's a problem that millions of people are dealing with every single day. In order to be able to correctly diagnose a skin cancer from a simple image, you need a lot of training. The entire field of dermatology has a specialization just in skin findings. That means a decade or more of continuous education just to be able to try and deal with a complex organism like your skin. It's skin. How hard could it possibly be? Well, it's evidently very difficult to diagnose skin cancers accordingly, but I'm sure you can tell where this is going. Researchers in the USA, they trained a neural network to diagnose skin findings from images. They trained their network using 129,000 images and their AI was able to perform equally, if not better than a dermatologist. Note that I said better than a dermatologist. No more two decades of studying in order to get your skin cancer diagnosed. We can just leave it up to Siri to tell you whether or not that weird growth on your shoulder is malignant or not. Hopefully from these examples, you can see that AI has a lot of potential in helping narrow down specific diagnoses, catching problems before they arise. But can we use AI to accomplish broader tasks? Like instead of just focusing on one specific type of cancer, what if we used an AI against all type of cancers? And for that matter, what does it mean to have cancer? Often when you treat a patient for a disease, you do it as sort of a one size fits all kind of treatment. We say, you have high cholesterol, take this statin pill. You have anemia, take this iron pill. You have cancer, take chemotherapy. We foot these treatments like they're one size fit all, but they're often not. And nowhere does this come more into play than something like cancer. Because with the example of cancer, a mutation in any one of several thousand sites in your DNA can cause a cancer. And as a cancer grows, it divides, it spreads, and it acquires even more mutation. We know thousands of people get breast cancer every single year, but what we don't appreciate the fact is that inside each of their tumors is a unique genetic imprint with its own unique mutations. So the way we approach cancer needs to take into account the precise details of the individual. Well, what does that look like when you're treating a cancer? If you have a cancer, and you have an oncologist that needs to make in a treatment, well, you have hundreds of thousands of mutations that you need to deal with, inherited mutations, exposures. You have complicated family histories. There's thousands of different treatments that are available. Well, well which mutations cause the cancer? Which ones don't? What are the available drugs? And has anyone ever tried this drug with this specific cancer? Which ones are effective? Which ones aren't effective? Somehow all of this information needs to be funneled into one person one oncologist, how is it physically possible for one person or even a small group of people to take into consideration all of these findings? Well, quite frankly, it isn't. But what we can do is that each one of these steps, we can leverage an AI to make things easier. You have hundreds of thousands of mutations in your cancer and you wanna predict which ones are the most lethal? No problem. We have an AI on a server that can do that for you. It's already run through our genome multiple times over and predicting which one of these mutations are most likely to cause a cancer. You have a complicated family history. There's some sort of cancer that's running to the family that's kind of weird that you've never seen before. Well, that's okay. We can take this family's inherited cancer and we can compare it with the families of millions of others of inherited cancer online using an AI and try and pinpoint what kind of inherited syndrome it might be. Well, there's thousands of available treatments going on. How are you possibly gonna pick the right drug for the specific kind of cancer that you have? Right now, there's an AI running around the clock to simulate how different drugs are going to interact with different cancers and which novel drug combinations are gonna be effective in treating cancer. If you put all of this together, you get something like the personalized oncogenomics program that's right out of BC. Full disclosure, I worked on this project. So using all the information online, all the genetic information of a cancer, family history, drug targets, and so much more, the team of researchers at the BC Cancer Agency, they've, they've created a program to identify specific targets for novel therapies in treating cancer. If you haven't seen it, the Cracking Cancer documentary on CBC, it's free, it's 40 minutes long, and I highly recommend it. 
Have you ever thought about treating a metastatic cancer that's going to kill someone with something as simple as metformin, a drug for diabetes? If that didn't come to your mind, obviously, I wouldn't blame you. But quite frankly, it's the subject of this documentary here. And it turns out that, yeah, you can use metformin to cure some people's cancer using AI along the way. Bottom line, AI has tremendous people for helping aid physicians or perhaps even succeeding them. So what are we waiting for? Why don't we just replace all our pathologists, all our radiologists, all our dermatologists with an AI? What's, what's the holdup? Well, like any tool, it has its drawbacks. AI is a field going through a massive series of changes very quickly. And it's always the case that this means there's gonna be mistakes and those mistakes are going to be costly. Tim Nickerbrew was hired by Google to analyze racial and gender disparities in facial recognition technology. She co-authored a paper which held a number of criticisms with large-scale AI. Firstly, the ecological footprint of running such a large AI across multiple servers around the world, that's massive. And often those externalities are borne out by disadvantaged people and minorities. Furthermore, AI can often fail to recognize language that is racist, sexist, and bigoted. And it can go one step farther. It can even generate false statements or propose misinformation. Shortly after its publication, she was fired from Google. This was just at the end of 2020. Gabru's work and her firing goes to show us that not only is the field of AI susceptible to bias, bigotry, discrimination, but those who actively work against it, particularly minorities, people of color, the marginalized, they're punished for speaking out against it. I know you all haven't been to the mall recently with COVID and everything, but if you've been to any colleagues in Calgary, Chinook Mall or Market Mall, guess what? Anytime that you've used a kiosk to find directions to Lush Cosmetics or something, the kiosk probably snapped a photo of you. Not only that, it then took your photo, it memorized your face, it assigned you a gender, and is currently storing that information in some database somewhere far away. How does that make you feel? Violated, angry, anxious? Are you just ambivalent to the whole thing and you really just don't care if some sort of computer system has your photo somewhere? Is it something that you even consider? All right, how about one more? Healthcare relies on algorithms to identify patients at high risk. We use these algorithms to prioritize which patients are going to receive more aggressive care. And these algorithms are used on millions of patients every single day. One such algorithm was studied and it's found to be biased vastly against Black people, thinking them as healthy when in fact they were ill and they should have received aggressive care. How could this have happened? Couldn't doctors have noticed and spotted that their own patients are getting shortchanged by an algorithm? Well, guess what? Algorithms, especially like those used in healthcare, they're not public knowledge. We rarely get a chance to peek under the hood and see exactly how they work. And when we do, we often don't like what we see. I know that in this lecture, we have medical students and even a couple of physicians. I wonder if you've asked yourself, when you enter a patient's details into an electronic health record, and it gives you a warning that this patient might need some extra attention or might recommend these procedures, did you ever consider that the algorithm decides who does and doesn't require extra care by taking into account a patient's race? Is the fact that the algorithm even accounts for a patient's race a good thing or a bad thing? Does the fact that you don't know exactly how an algorithm treats a patient's race, does that bother you? Does the fact that the algorithm could be discriminating against people of color without your knowledge, how does that make you feel? Okay, one last example. I showed you this image at the very beginning and asked you whether or not this cancer, this is cancer. The AI correctly identified that this mammogram is cancer, while six radiologists got it wrong. So the AI is obviously better than radiologists. We should fire the radiologists and replace them with algorithms, right? Well, I didn't give you the whole picture. This is the second half of this image. And again, I ask you, do these mammograms show you cancer? Well, radiologists certainly thought so. Six out of six radiologists, they correctly identified that these two images that you see on your right, they show a mammogram of cancerous growth, and this patient needs immediate follow-up. The AI, the one that analyzed 
hundreds of thousands of x-rays and trained to be better than radiologists, it got these wrong. It incorrectly labeled these lesions as non-cancerous. Imagine that. After analyzing hundreds of thousands of images in the most obvious case where six out of six radiologists got this question right, the AI messed up and it got it wrong. What does that mean for the future of AI? Are you less inclined to trust in AI's diagnosis now? I realize that this is a bit of a somber note to leave you on, but it's an important step to learning about AI and it's not one that is very well appreciated. We like to think that technology in general makes everyone's lives better, that a rising tide lifts all boats, and make no mistake, the potential of AI to be helpful in medicine is massive, but it's not without its caveats. Hopefully after this lecture, you understand the basics of how an AI works and what people mean when we say, I trained in AI. But really, this is just a start of your journey, both in AI and in medicine in general. The next lectures in these series, they're going to start getting you into the nitty gritty. We're gonna start learning how exactly to build an artificial intelligence. What tools do we use? How do we evaluate our AI? How do we decide on the number of images to use for training? How many nodes are we gonna use? Pretty soon, if you keep up with these exercises, you'll be able to read and understand all these papers about AI that I cited in this lecture. So I highly recommend you stick with it. And I look forward to seeing how you progress. Uh, Shane, are there some questions that I'll be able to answer? Yes, there are a couple. Start with an easy one. What did you study in undergrad? Um, I studied cell biology, and I did a thesis in Bayesian networks and machine learning. Okay, next one, a little bit harder. Could an AI not aggregate the inputs that are determined to be outliers in the example where there's a horse being applied to the cat and dog discriminator? And then, yeah, go ahead. Um, I imagine that it most certainly could. The exact mechanics of how you would do such a thing are a bit beyond me. I don't have, I don't have it off the top of my head. But Mason, mainly when we're engineering things like an artificial intelligence or a network, we're constantly checking it along the way. We're doing things like feeding it wacky images or weird training data just to be able to see how it reacts and how we might improve it. So certainly in the process of training an artificial intelligence and building one, you are presumably going to be doing that, at least if you like building more functional AI. There are definitely some people who build very shoddy AI and then just ship it out because no one gets to see it. So, but that's a very good point. Well, I'll add that although we know that those images are outliers, the, the AI doesn't know. All it knows is what we've told it to look for. And, but you can tell them to give up, give you a confidence value, how certain it is. This is what, what, it, what it is. And you can kind of classify that way, but that's, Dealing with outliers is a major challenge in the field. And next question. How would random forests compare to narrow AIs in accuracy? Ooh, that's a, that's a bit beyond me. I personally did not do a lot of random forest work. Shane, you might be able to answer this one better. So technically random forest is narrow AI in that it's intended for a specific purpose, a, a specific goal. Uh, it's more of an aggregate of a, a series of narrow AIs. And you can get improved accuracy with, with random forests. Uh, but they're, it's a bit more complicated to, to coordinate. Uh, I think we'll talk about random forests more in a, a future lecture. And another question, what causes algorithms to exhibit racial bias? Is it because of a lack of diversity within training sets? And is there a learned component? Um, I would say all of the above. There are a number of decisions when it comes to training an AI. If you do something as simple as train an AI to recognize faces, guess what? Turns out a lot of the databases of faces, they tend to have mostly old white people. So the AI is very good at recognizing old white people, but the moment that you ask it to recognize a brown person or a black person, it kind of freaks out on you and it gets very bad results. So certainly in the process of engineering, there are steps that you can take to ensure that diversity is preserved. Now, these are not steps that are often taken. Uh, the other thing is that with AIs, when you're, for instance, getting data off of the internet, for instance, you maybe, I don't know, scrub Facebook for images, unethically, mind you, 
very unethically. This is what Cambridge Analytica did. You scrub Facebook for a bunch of information and you use that to train your artificial intelligence network. Well, if you get a bunch of garbage data on Facebook then and you feed that garbage data to an AI, then you'll end up with a garbage AI, quite frankly. And that's just one of the results of trying to amass huge data sets in order to train is that you scoop in garbage and as a result, you get garbage results. And we have another question, which I have a couple of examples I can use to answer this one ready to go. So how exactly would an AI get some scenarios wrong if they already analyzed thousands of images? Do you mind if I answer this one? Go for it. So uh, there's a couple of examples. One, there was uh, an AI trained to identify, uh, distinguish between wolves and, uh, and polar bears or something like that. And you feed it thousands and thousands of images of wolves and polar bears. And then when you start giving it different images, it starts getting some of them wrong. And when you look further into it, the reason it got them wrong is because they, they learned not to, not so much to identify what a wolf looks like, but, or what a polar bear looks like, rather that they identified the environment that you usually find a polar bear in. So it, it's looking at the snowy backdrop of a polar bear's home and it's saying, oh, this is a polar bear rather than looking at the polar bear itself. So you, if you give it an image of a wolf on a snowy backdrop, it'll say, oh, that's a polar bear. Uh, with a medical example, there was a, a study, uh, I think it was diagnosing cancer based on medical record or survivability of mortality of cancer based on medical records and got tons of uh, patient records from various facilities and it seemed to get a lot of them quite accurate uh, but it turned out what it was actually honing in on was not the data in the patient's record but rather the location of where the patient got treatment so patients that were sent to this cancer center were those that had really advanced cancer. And so it wasn't looking at, oh, the patient has these symptoms, the, these comorbid conditions, they have a short prognosis, rather that simply for, for the fact that they had already been uh, sent to that particular cancer center already meant they had a, a lower diagnosis. So it's AI tends to look at not always what you want it to look at. And that's how it can frequently make mistakes. Then with a couple more questions. Oh, also, I should just quickly mention, um, these slides are going to be posted afterwards and the lecture is being recorded. So if you've been taking notes, um, why? And uh, so next question, with deep learning, is there a general limit for data augmentation? In other words, how much is too much? Um, that is a very complicated question. A lot of researchers err on the side of caution and say that we will always uh, use more data sets. And then we can, like if we have a huge amalgamation of data, we will split it up into different components or different parts and test different modalities with it. Generally speaking, more data is a good thing, but as you'll learn with future lectures is that that's not always the case, particularly with examples that were brought up by like Timnit and other ethicists is that in the process of building such large data sets, you lose diversity, you lose nuance. So it depends on what you're training for, I suppose. Uh, well, if you're training for large scale population dynamics, then by all means use a data set of a million people, but you're going, you should recognize that you're going to lose nuances and finer details in the process. And we'll cover data augmentation in other lectures, but generally augmenting data amplifies bias. So that's, if your data is biased, the more you augment, the more risk of, of bias in your AI. Then does this course in AI mostly relate to application of images? How about databases? This will cover uh, a variety of different data sets. I chose um, image recognition for the examples because I enjoy looking at photos of cute dogs and cute cats. Makes for better presentations too. Yes. 
And then another question, is 100 artificial images for one real image too much, or is it unique to each task? Depends on the task. That's going to be my answer for a lot of these questions. In terms of choosing exact types of data to use, exact types of images, artificial images versus like real images that you've sourced from whatever database, the best answer I can give is that it depends on your task and it depends on how much time and energy you're willing to spend to combat some of the biases and facets that come up with using augmented images or uh, artificially created images. So unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you. Someone with a PhD will be able to answer better. Generally, more, more, uh, perhaps maybe you could clarify what you meant by artificial images might be a good idea. Um, but I'll move on to the next question. How can you tell how the AI is making decisions? How did the researchers know the AI was making the decision of polar bear? It was based on snow. Well, this is a, an, an entire field of research called explainable AI, and it's a, a big challenge. Uh, you can kind of extract the, the data at each, at each point. At, so each neuron has its a data that it receives and does its transformation. So you can extract the data at any point along that network and uh, correlate it to the images or different or words or whatever the data style type is. And you can kind of figure it out from there. But that's a huge problem in AI is figuring out what exactly is it doing and can we trust AI tools without knowing what exactly it's doing. This in particular is one of the reasons why ethicists like Tim Nagaburu have criticized large scale AIs because they're just so massive that it becomes almost impossible to figure out exactly what they're doing and how they're making their decisions. They basically become a black box and while useful, that also has certain dangers that we need to recognize. Okay, I think that is all the questions. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed and learned something and is excited to learn a little bit more about AI and medicine. Uh, for those of you who signed up for our workshops, the first one will be on Wednesday with a very basic intro to coding. And if you've signed up for Stream B, the medicine medical data focus, the next lecture will be next weekend. Otherwise, uh, uh, the AI focus will be in two weeks.